and welcome to uh, a brand new promotional class for Script Camp, how to create a TV show. So this is open to everyone, and if you want to join us, if you're watching on one of our other uh, social media places and you want to join us for these classes, you should come by Discord. Our Discord server is called Script Camp, and we have a bunch of events like this coming up this month, and a bunch of new boot camps starting up soon to help you go from idea to finished draft of brand new scripts for feature films and for TV pilots. Today we're going to be looking at how to the sort of elements that go into coming up with the world and characters of a TV show and starting to think of how we can create conflict that will last for years and create stories that will last for years based on this just arrangement of the various pieces of our grand board game that we'll be playing. This is not really going to be a class on how to sell a TV show. I know that the, the title might sort of be ambiguous in that way. This is how to create a TV show in the sense of how to come up with the fascinating worlds and the interesting characters that populate them that are make make for the foundation of TV shows. This isn't going to be about how to um, like film a TV show or how to call up Netflix and pitch a TV show. Those things are all coming later when you have these basic foundational skills down really, really well. And so we need to just really focus on these um, the ground level work of interesting worlds, interesting characters before we can start to think about getting a show off the ground um, or even perhaps, you know, getting your pilots read and getting staffed on a show, which is usually going to be the steps that come first before you're creating and running actual, you know, multi-million dollar TV shows. Because a script is not just a story, it's an invitation to collaborate on cr creating a multi-million dollar company that will employ potentially hundreds of people over many, many years. So that's not exactly an easy step just to go from writing at, at home by yourself in your spare time to running a multi-million dollar company, which is sort of what being a showrunner is. So to that end, we're going to look at these just basic elements of this and how to arrange characters in a world in such a way that we can create fascinating conflict and either explore the same world and same situation week by week, or on the other end, create a, a much larger, longer story called like a premise. Usually we're going to be calling these premise-based shows, something like, you know, you're lost or you're... <clears throat> Um, Battlestar Galactica or, or Breaking Bad or things like this that are like a much longer movie that takes a long time to explore chapter by chapter, as opposed to the status quo based shows, something more like South Park or Family Guy, where we just re revisit the same location and set up week by week. Um, so we'll look at both of those today. Um, make sure if you're on Discord, so please just keep your microphone muted for the most part. You can find that on the left hand side of your Discord window. You can see ooh, this here. This small gray icon, if that's up, that means your mic is muted. If you click it again, you will turn it off and thus disable your mic. Um, so if you could keep them muted for the most part, we'll have times for you to be able to speak out loud and volunteer and interact with the class. That's what Script Camp is all about. So, um, but uh, yeah, wait, wait until those moments where we do call upon you. So please keep your comments to the chat, the text chat for the most part. And if you're watching on one of our other uh, streaming places, then come by our, our Discord and you can hop right in the class with us. Um, okay, what is Script Camp? We're a screenwriting community that's focused on taking you from idea to completed draft. Um, and we have lots of free classes, events, and workshops like this one right now. And we have some classes for our supporting members, such as Boot Camps, Writer's Lab, and Advanced Lab. We're adding new classes and new servers all the time in our sort of Skill Camp company. Um, Skill Camp is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to bringing free and low-cost classes to help you learn skills to reach your life goals. Script Camp is the first and biggest of all of our various servers on our network. Um, but we have, coming up close, we have WordCamp at our second biggest, and that one is focused on novel writing. We currently are wrapping up an, our first novel boot camp in that class where we've gone from page one to the final page. What do you call that? Go from idea to finish draft of a, of a book. Um, in 12 weeks. And we have various boot camp programs like that that will take you from just idea to completed version of something in a, a short time span, usually four to eight weeks for most things. So um, we have new classes coming soon for supporting members. So definitely come by these servers and say hi. Here's just a little about me. I've been, I moved to LA in, in 2015. Have by now probably been writing full length stories for about 11, 12 years. I got signed for the first time in 2017 and have been a repped and working writer since then, mostly specializing in horror thriller films and no nowadays doing a lot of rewrites on smaller, for smaller production companies and for writer directors on their horror thriller scripts. Um, I have a thriller script set up at a major production company in town. I've placed in Nickel Semifinals, uh, Launchpad Top 10, um, and I teach the boot camps in the weekly writer's lab. So um, how to help Skill Camp, you can donate 
Um, you can become a supporting member and get access to all boot camps and labs from $29 a month at our lowest rate. That's with the yearly discount. You'll be saving 40% on your um, yearly donation. You can volunteer. If you know a skill or language you'd like to teach, you can contact myself or Nacho. And you can tell your friends. So you can refer to somebody and you will both get a free month of the um, pro subscription um, or the unlimited subscription plus a free month of Arc Studio Pro, which is a great screenwriting software. Here's some stuff coming up. We have this one. Um, this is uh, uh, December 14th. This is We're going to be looking at some um, TV fundamentals today. We'll be looking at writing the first page of a script on Sunday the 18th at 11 a.m. These times are all in Pacific time. We have a Christmas Pitch Fest coming up on December 21st where you can pitch your movie idea and win prizes. Your movie does not. Your movie idea should be developed to the point where you can, in two to three minutes, just explain the basics of the plot. You should refer to some of our earlier pitching classes and pitching workshops, which we have recordings up of on our YouTube, if you're curious what this looks like and what to do. But you have you know, two to three minutes to explain the story, who it's about, what's happening, what's the inciting incident, and basically just verbally take us through the story to about the midpoint and then kind of suggest what happens towards the end and like the you want to imply the trajectory of the rest of the story um that's the basics of it so try to prep something about two to three minutes long your script does not have to be holiday themed but we'll have i think a special prize in that category so if you have holiday story ideas this is a good time to pitch them we'll be sort of awarding these prizes based on how compelling the idea is and how well it's presented so a combination of both of those um, we'll look at more pitching stuff on the 28th of December at 6 p.m. That's going to be how to, the class is called How to Sell Your Movie Idea. It's really, we mean sell it in the room or sell it in terms of the story. We're not talking about, like, actually getting money for it at that time. Though, you know, that can that does come up. Just, I can answer those questions to some extent. Um, but that's going to be Wednesday at 6 o'clock, and we're going to talk about the communication of story ideas, feature length uh, primarily. Uh, this is focused on movies, so we're going to be talking about how to communicate the main points of a story between 90 and 120 minutes long and then we'll look more at tv writing on friday the 30th at six o'clock where we'll talk about writer's room dynamics we might bring in a writer uh, a tv writer guest and we'll just be talking more about these fundamental skills of tv writing there's a couple more coming up in january after the break that's when our tv pilot boot camp resumes on friday the 6th and our feature boot camp starts up sunday january 8th so there's plenty of stuff going on um and like i said we'll link this uh the slides afterwards so you can review these um our website calendar is still not up to date so don't go by that but the the events tab on discord sh should be fully up to date so if you're wondering what's coming up check out that events tab in the top left hand corner of your discord screen what are the boot camps these are courses that take you from idea to first draft or from rough draft to a more polished rewrite if you're bringing a rewrite to the class instead of a brand new idea and using our step-by-step -step practical method in these two-hour weekly classes kind of like this one that you're in now we go from idea all the way to a draft being done in eight weeks for the feature, six weeks for the pilot. And we've done classes in the past, such as four weeks for short film or four weeks for our pitching kind of uh, exercises. But um, every other boot camp will have its own length, uh, nothing longer than 12 weeks so far. Our novel boot camp at 12 weeks is the longest one we've tried. But we have other boot camps on our other servers too, such as animation, which is currently ongoing. Uh, where's the thought there'd be a slide for that up front that's okay there's probably one at the end but um yeah we have weekly anim uh, boot camps in animation and we have a coding boot camp coming up on code camp starting in the new year so here's a preview of the tv pilot boot camp schedule this is not what this class is but this is if you want to look ahead at what we'll be doing we started with our week zero last week already where we started on fundamentals of tv t story design and log lines a log line being the one sentence expression of the premise of your show and there's is going to be a different version of that for both the pilot and also the series. So you have two log lines total for a TV show. For the December 16th week one class, the student's assignment is to revise your log lines based on the early feedback you got in these classes. December 16th is when we resume. That's after the holidays. That's when you will be... Oh, sorry. That's actually this upcoming Friday. So we have one more class before the end of the year in TV. That's where there'll be final students will be finalizing series and pilot log lines and continuing to fill out the sketchbook, which is a really fundamental part of uh, the method that I sort of teach here, where we have this sketchbook document to gather all your ideas and notes and research and inspiration and links to pictures and videos and any other stuff that's just going to help you in your pre-writing process. Um, week two is outlining, so we're going to look at the broad strokes of the story, the major events that need to fall into place um, in the structure. Week three, we're going to look at expanding that outline into scene cards, which is a full paragraph for every single scene. 
week four through six, that's actually be go to pages, which means you start writing and formatting those scenes in your screenwriting software and writing dialogue and actually blocking out the full scenes. We don't we don't do that until halfway through any boot camp. So that first half is really, really focused on getting every scene in place and organizing your journey forward before you actually put pen to paper on the screenplay pages themselves. Week four is first act, week five is second act, week six is third act with the first draft finished by February 10th. Whew. Okay, lots of uh, lots of announcements, lots of things coming up, lots of setup. Thank you for linking uh, the coding boot camp, uh, Joel, in the chat. You can see Joel's upcoming boot camp will start Sunday, January 8th at noon. So if you have any interest in coding and are any experience level, even if you've never touched it before in your life and you want to learn a little bit more about Python and the basics of programming languages, then check out Code Camp starting Sunday, January 8th. Um, so a bunch of links to the different servers in the chat there. Um, so you can just click on any of those and join those all for free. And by getting a membership to Script Camp, you will also be getting full access to everything in all of our Skill Camp uh, servers. These are not separate subscriptions. One subscription gives you access to everything that we do. I want to stop and take questions on anything I've mentioned so far just before we jump into today's class on creating TV shows. Anyone want to know anything just based on what I've mentioned up until this point? Okay, if not, then we will just go ahead. Let me check the stream people chat. Oh, here we go. Here, possibly a question. Um, El Michi says, hello, right now I'm watching because I can't, I can't not hear you so loud at home, but I really want to be here. Okay, I'm not sure what it means if you can't not hear me. That sounds like you can hear me, but uh, thanks for being here. I hope that you can join us maybe on Discord if you'd like to interact with the classes more. Um, and that goes to anyone also watching on YouTube or Twitch or things like this. You can type questions in the chat there, and we will be able to see them, but it just takes me a second to find it sometimes. Uh, okay, so shall we go forward on creating TV shows? I think we should. Um, so let's get started on this. Um, uh, oh, last thing. Yeah, if you want to sign up, scriptcamp.net slash classes, and you can buy a course on its own. Uh, or you can go to scriptcamp.net slash membership, and you can sign up for that either monthly or yearly um, subscription, in which case you'll get... Uh, unlimited access to everything we do on all these servers at Script Camp. All these various great classes, over 70 hours or 80 hours, I think, at this point, of content every month. Um, and you will get that 40% discount by just buying a yearly plan rather than monthly. If you haven't enrolled yet, but you'd like to sign up on the website, we have a uh, poll that our co-founder, Nacho, will leave in the chat in just a moment. And you can use that to indicate that you intend to sign up. If you just click that number one in the chat right now in that poll that you see with the blue numbers, that will mean that we can give you instant access to our boot camp channels. It doesn't obligate you to sign up, but this just, just indicates that you intend or plan to, and we can uh, get you started and, and get you into our exclusive boot camp chatting areas and hopefully start giving you that extra feedback that'll help you get started before the class begins. Okay, um, so uh, let's go to, I think we are not going to start with this discussion just because we've had quite a bit of intro and setup, and I would prefer to probably just start going into the content of the course first, but we will have some times for the um, participants here to speak up and give suggestions and all kinds of fun stuff. Okay, so um, bef before we go any further, um, let's just look at some of these very fundamental basic things here. So in the US, TV shows are written by staffs, but they still are usually going to be created by one single person. That's like the person that writes the pilot that kicks the whole thing off. And this pilot, you're going to want to work on this with your manager for quite a while until you're ready to go out with it. And once it actually starts to get interest somewhere, this is like the reason we don't write additional episodes is because you're going to have to go through development with that pilot, meaning that the people that are interested in potentially buying and developing that show are going to want to change things with you and like put their own sort of hands on it and modify it and give you lots of notes and feedback based on just the pilot and what we call a Bible, a Bible being a sort of usually like 10 to 25-ish page, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, but depending on the complexity of the show. But it's a document that just kind of lays out everything that we'll be working on today, such as locations, um, the rules of the world, the tone of the world, the characters, really, really, really f fleshing out and focusing on the characters that populate this world. So that document, that Bible, and that pilot episode are the, really, the only things that you need to write. 
You never need to write additional episodes, and in fact, you will end up having to throw away almost all that work, assuming a show ever goes forward, because they're going to want to do so much development based on the pilot that you might as well just not write any other episodes. Um, so you don't even really need to write, be writing Bibles until you have fantastic skills in writing pilots. Like, you're not even going to really need that Bible until a pilot starts to really get a lot of attention. Then people might say, okay, let's take a look at that Bible. Um, meaning that you can just always put it off until later. You know, a couple years down the line, if you're just starting out, then you're going to want to, you're, or I should say, you're going to want to work on your skills in writing pilots features and just other kind of scripted stories for a long time before you're ready to go out and start making Bibles and pitching shows and stuff. So just really focus on these fundamentals first, and you should look at this as going to the gym and running laps for several years, which, which is sort of how we describe what script camp is. We're not really trying to help you dig for gold to find that perfect script um, that will get sold and get you money and achieve all your dreams. We're trying to reframe your thinking into looking at this more like a gym that you go to to start running laps because this takes a, this is a big uphill climb and takes a, a lot of effort, and it's a long journey, and we really should approach this as the act of getting better for several years before we start to reach beyond our grasp, I should say. So we're going to be looking today at writing the, or putting together something that resembles a series Bible, and this is something that you should have in mind, and maybe work on like a mini version of this for yourself as you're writing pilots, just to improve at writing pilots. Um, but you don't really have to write full, publishable, super readable, awesome, intriguing Bibles for your shows until you're really far, really far along down the line. I've only done this once, and that's when a director was attached to the show. So at that point, they asked for the Bible. Um, but up until then, you, you're, if your pilots aren't compelling, no one's going to want to read all this anyway. So we're going to look at making just the version of this that you're going to use for yourself. Um, and you're going to use to help kind of figure out, hey, what's going to happen in your pilot? Because in some, if you're coming at this from the perspective of world and character first, then sometimes multiple different storylines for the pilot episode might present themselves to you and might seem like, oh, the story could start in several different places. Or if it's a status quo sort of based show, like a, like a lot of cartoons or a lot of sitcoms, you could kind of just write many very completely different storylines to for us to get involved in this world. If we're just sort of being dropped in the world of the characters, like in something like, I don't know, The Simpsons, then we don't really need to... Um, there's not one thing that needs to fall into place in order to get that sh get the machinery of the show off the ground and to activate what we might call this, this show's story engine. Um, so we should talk... I wish I had a slide on it, but we should definitely talk story engines because that's another sort of one of these you know TV writing basics. What is a story engine? Well, a story engine, there's not one it's not comprised of just one thing but it's a combination of different factors it's sort of like we would refer to it as like the machinery of your plot that keeps generating stories using the kind of the fuel that you put into it being the relationships and dynamics at play so it's like a combination of all the factors that are going to allow stories to keep being generated in your world for many years to come because tv shows a strong enough story engine will feel like it can sustain stories for years um, TV shows go on for years, and theoretically unlimited years in some cases, with the exception being these limited series are the more sort of modern style of longer limited series that have a very defined plot. Up until recently, that was not really the standard for how TV was done, and you'd want to create situations and setups and dynamics between characters that can persist for many years, and although they will evolve over time, these kind of foundational pieces are arranged in such a way that we, we can see how that's going to create conflict forever. So let me keep, throw a really, really simple story engine at you. Who, you anybody watch uh, Courage the Cowardly Dog, the cartoon from when I was a kid? <laughs> I hope somebody yes. has. Go ahead. Yes, I said. Oh, yes, you've seen it. Okay, great. So the story engine for Courage. Who are the main characters in Courage? Courage is the main character. Uh-huh. And his owners, he's Eustace and Muriel. Yep. That's it. That's the main cast right there. <laughs> Isn't that so simple? It's great. There's a dog. He's owned by an old lady. That's his, you know, really benevolent, lovely, kind, kind little owner. And her horrible, mean husband. They live in the middle of a town called Nowhere that seems to be somewhere in the kind of haunted Midwest of the U.S. They live in a tiny ramshackle farmhouse in the middle of a dusty farm that doesn't seem to grow anything and every week something creepy happens then courage ends up needing to protect muriel from the bad things he's like her kind of personal guard dog because she's the one that saved him now he protects her 
Um, and in the meantime, Eustace, the kind of mean, angry husband, is usually there to throw a wrench in the works to constantly act as an antagonist and villain, despite the fact that something creepy is happening. He's usually going to use it for his own sort of ends or to, to, to get, make a bunch of money or just to do... He has some really selfish goal that's usually not entirely related to the creepy thing going on, but that ends up getting in the way or additionally antagonizing courage and kind of pushing him into more dangerous situations. That's the story engine for the show. There's not a ton to it. As you can see, there's three main characters. The setup is just something weird happens every week. And the conflict is, well, then Courage needs to address that monster or um, time portal that opens up or, like, ghost that emerges or curse that he unlocks or something like that. It's going to be something different every week, which lends it this sort of anthological... It's like a horror anthology almost, right? But this, we have to look at the basics of the story engine, which are just the arrangement of the, those three main characters, the dynamic between them. It's so simple. In fact, let me just pick up, pick, bring up a picture of uh, the characters. Um, so uh, the really, really easy way that we can create a story engine is just by creating conflict or dynamics between these characters that involve a lot of conflict. I don't know why Freaky Fred is on here. He's not one of the main characters. Here they are. So this is the entire story engine for Courage the Cowardly Dog. I mean, cur uh, something bad happens week after week. Courage is going to try to protect Muriel from it, and Eustace is going to get in the way or actively try to hurt Courage because Eustace hates Courage. Um, so the we have constant conflict between them, these two characters that truly do not like each other. We have two characters that really do like each other, and often Eustace is jealous of the relationship between Courage and Muriel, or else he is jealous that they spend more time together than he gets to or that she prioritizes him the dog over him sometimes so you can see there's always going to be conflict between courage and eustace courage is always going to be trying to help and protect muriel so he always has an easy objective episode after episode it's never like a mystery what the object it's like popeye almost right popeye's a really similar story engine where it's just there's popeye there's bluto there's olive oil and sometimes there's like uh, Popeye's friend Wimpy that plays a minor role, but it's like that's that's the the story of Popeye is uh, Popeye is a sailor, his girlfriend or the girl that he really likes and wants to be his girlfriend gets kidnapped by a big guy named Bluto, then he has to go and save her. That's the show. And oh, and sometimes he eats a can of spinach and gets really strong. And uh, by sometimes, I mean every single episode. And he uses that to beat up Bluto in whatever sort of contraption or monster he's enlisted to his forces this time. Um, so you see cartoons like this have very simple story engines. Now, what's? can you give me an example of a show that has a really complex story engine? Sopranos. Okay, Morgana, how would you define what's the story engine in Sopranos? What's what's What are those elements that are creating conflict throughout the years of the show uh, um i would say it is the the main thing is the conflict between tony's professional life and his family life and then you have the side stories all of that yeah i think you're right that's the sort of the foundation of it it's about the hook of the show is that it's about a family man who is also a mobster killer, you know, uh, criminal. Um, and that, you're right, that sort of, the clash of his two lives is how we might sort of classify the story engine in Sopranos. I haven't actually seen Sopranos, I've just seen bits of it, and I, I just know it through sort of culture. Um, but you're right, that is the story engine there, But there's and, and we can sort of blow that up much bigger too, because there's well, a lot of characters in it, there's more, the main character is very layered and has way more dimensions than Courage the Cowardly Dog does. So you're right, that is a much more complex story engine in terms of the main character and his relationship to ther his therapist and therapy, which I believe is a big uh, sort of recurring um, story element for the main character. He's trying to like cent learn who he is as a person and maybe become a little better as a person, but at the same time has to do worse and worse things to succeed in crime. But at the same time, is trying to balance his relationship to his wife and his children and people who don't know that he's a criminal. There's a lot of relationships there and a lot of dynamics that can create a lot of conflict. What's another show that has a really complex story engine? Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say. I would go ahead. say any show that has, that isn't like. That has like a continuous storyline has a more complex story engine. 
Yeah, usually that is the case because sometimes season by season the story engine might be slightly different or like the machinery of it will adjust over time because much longer premise based shows sometimes ev they just they just by definition evolve. They have to evolve. Um they're more about gradual change than features are, but they are still about change over time. Um in terms of breaking bad, I would put that in the medium level of complexity because the the essentials of the story engine there are Walter White is a chemistry teacher who's trying to raise money for his family by cooking meth. So it's similar to Sopranos in that he has the criminal hidden life and his um, regular life, and he's trying to find a balance in between. We have his relationship with Jesse there. It's not incredibly complicated, but it's definitely more complicated than most cartoons. It's helpful that Walter's kind of objective doesn't really change until the... Like, it has the same story engine season by season, unlike what we were just talking about, where some premise shows will over time evolve to different story engines breaking bad does stay the same it's just that it amplifies and the stakes go way up and up and up season by season which they usually do in, in shows like that something like i'm thinking if you want to well, go really complex something like westworld go ahead yeah i was gonna say what about sneaky pete because there's so many different levels there's multiple storylines and it goes um back and forth into uh different times and it's basically quite a, I, I think sneaky pete, uh, pete is a very complex story even though on the face of it it looks quite um like linear mm -hmm. i i find it quite um it has multiple levels i haven't seen that one but i have i've just seen posters for it but yeah it, you'll you'll definitely find shows that have very complex characters and multiple timelines often do have much more complicated story engines something like you know sharp objects or true detective um, very, very complicated. You have characters that we're rejoining at different points in their lives throughout the episode. So essentially they're separate people, but they're also the same people. And you have to keep in mind like how much they've changed over the years and how what has happened to them has affected them and their mindset moving forward. So yeah, it shows with multiple branching timelines, uh, incredibly complex story engines sometimes. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. So yeah, these are things sure. to, to keep in mind when you're when you're trying to write pilots and you're trying to learn how to do this. You should, I mean, you can bite off as big a bite as you want to chew, but just keep in mind, like, to write a show like The Wire or, like, Westworld, this takes so, so, so many skills and such uh, a, a, um, uh, an eye for um, the, not, not only the, the creating a web of characters that will continue to be able to interact from season to season in fascinating ways that grow and evolve over time. But you also have to have an idea of, of your limitations and what, what is too much for you in order to, to, create a, to, to create a very complex show. You need to know when to stop adding stuff. Um, and that sense of restraint is really kind of key when you're in the creating your show process because you don't want to build the world too big and then make, put yourself in a position where your pilot only explores a tiny fraction of what that show has to offer. Because the thing is, when you're trying to break in as a tv writer almost you know it's like your show's not going to get made like your pilots are not all going to get made into shows and even if you even if you're incredibly lucky and successful you might get staffed on a show maybe or something like that but it's going to be like years and years before you're in a position to actually be creating a brand new show for, for the most part um so to, to that end you have to know when to rein yourself in and hold yourself back and start to limit and excise things that are not going to be able to you're, you're not going to be meaningfully be able to interact with in just the pilot but you have to put the good stuff in the pilot and you can't like I'm, i see this mistake constantly from people writing pilots in our pilot boot camps that they'll be like okay it's going to be a show about a farmer who is trying to keep his farm going but he only gets to the farm at the end of the pilot and then they're like okay but at the at the, the later episodes that's going to be about the farming the first episode is about how he gets to the farm and then I'm like, no, the pilot needs to actually be the thing that you're saying that you're promising in the rest of the show, or else it's not going to feel like the pilot is a representative sample of what your show has to offer and the sort of unique thrills of that world. Um, okay, so let's move on to our first little activity here, I think, which is going to be uh, we're going to um, Break, up, break down The Simpsons, um, because I know this show by heart, and I, I think a lot of people have seen it and know the characters pretty well. So strong TV ideas emphasize interesting worlds and the rich characters that populate them. So we're going to list out the most important characters, locations in Springfield, which is the setting for our show, and we're going to 
add in a couple points of interest under each of these locations and think of how well, you can use your, your memory of episodes that you've seen to think of what are some points of interest in some of these places if you need. But also just be thinking like maybe what in future episodes could we do with those things and be thinking as all of these things as a springboard for many, many stories, which is the great thing about these status quo shows is that you can have a big old toolbox full of characters like this. There's so many characters. Um, as long as you understand that each episode, you're going to have to really limit your scope and just focus on a, one or two of them, or, you know, like one to three storylines at a time. Um, and but, uh, but by the nature of the show having gone on for, you know, 20 years, there's a, a pretty big repertoire or, or, you know, arsenal, whatever, of characters for us to uh, draw tons of different stories from. It's why there's this whole... You know, the Simpsons did it sort of trope in, in writing where it's like, oh, we can't do that in an episode. They did that on The Simpsons in 1995. Um, and it's kind of true because we have so many episodes and so many storylines that we've gotten from this little world. Okay, um, so let me take a question really quick from the chat because I see somebody tag me and then I will... Um, or I think I have a couple questions in the chat. Then we will start to uh, break down main uh, characters and locations from Simpsons and we'll start to look at what does the world of a show sort of look like on the page? Here's the first question. What do I think of regular show? I've only seen, I think, two episodes of regular show, but I liked it and it seemed funny. Um, I watched a lot of uh, um, Adventure Time, but I never got to regular show. Um, just haven't seen that much of it yet. Here's another question. Would I be right to assume a complex story engine will be largely based upon how much the main character's main want constantly varies? I can't help but notice that a strong story engine seems to be based around a strong character want that maintains over seasons um yeah so having characters that change their goals or adopt different goals over time will usually lead to very complex story engines something something like westworld where the character it's almost like a different genre in between seasons or there's that show miracle workers on tbs that just pretty much is a different genre season by season it's largely because yeah the characters achieved their first goal and now we need to f put have them start on a new one um, have them start doing something else, which might involve radically different stakes and radically different tactics by which they will approach solving that goal. So to have that many different... You have to have characters that are able to tackle multiple seasons that each of which needs to be tackled in different ways. So your characters must be more layered and complex and have, you know, complicated skill sets and expertise and things like that. And also you just have to have a, a big world with um, a big cast and a lot going on in, in shows like that in order for it to make sense that we're going to be changing character goals. There has to be plenty of room for you to play in in those worlds. So yeah, definitely. Those sorts of shows where the characters are achieving some goals and then radically changing them, then they sort of almost become different shows over time. And yeah, that creates a very complicated story engine. Uh, another question from the chat. Would love thoughts on the workings of The Office and Friends, especially episode one. I haven't seen Friends. I've watched The Office a lot, though. I don't remember much of the pilot, but The Office is uh, one of these sort of status quo based workplace sitcoms which we will talk a little bit a bit about later today wherein the show is basically just the characters like the the situations that come up are only going to be um things that are pretty limited to the scope of the office i guess as the seasons go on sometimes they do leave the office and start doing other stuff a bit but the nice thing about workplace sitcoms is that a there's always going to be a market for them and b they're sort of easy to come up with a cast for because you know the different roles that need to be fulfilled at different jobs and different archetypes sometimes just nicely fit like feel like they fit into those different roles so for instance having the main character be a bumbling boss just makes a lot of sense for a uh i guess we should say jim is sort of the protagonist of the, well it's kind of a two-hander between michael and jim isn't it i i guess it uh, depending on how you balance the main characters and in, in most episodes i would say michael is sort of the main character but jim sort of takes precedence in a lot of storylines too um, in any case, it's a very, very elegant, very, super, you know, legendary uh, sitcom, definitely. At least those first, you know, however many seasons until Michael left, and then it was like, why are we even still here? Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, and, and you sort of see how central Michael is to the show after he leaves, too. So I guess Michael is pretty much the main character of The Office. Um, but uh, what was the question? What, my, what are my thoughts? It's It's a good show. <laughs> Uh, here's a question. Do I think there's a danger in doing what they did in Westworld if the tone and genre seemingly changes, or would I advise against this? Is it circumstantial to the story? I assume it's both, but maybe still worth asking. So, um, there's definitely danger in drastically changing the premise of your show after a season or two seasons or something, but um, until you're a high-level showrunner, that's not ever going to be a possibility, so we don't really have to worry about these things. Um, I would say drastically changing your 
premise within an episode is definitely a problem. Yeah, so trying to try to keep that first episode like oh I think is someone talking or is that my own mic that I'm hearing feedback from? Thanks. If everyone could just make sure that your mics are muted, I think I was hearing my own voice for a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, so keep your keep your pilot for for the most part setting up one premise, like the premise that the at least the first season is going to revolve around. Paul says American Horror Story is cool, different story every season. Yeah, that, that's anthology format. That's a little bit di um, different than traditional show, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I like that as well. Fargo is similar, but Fargo is different. Um, it's not. It, it is kind of an anthology, but it's like different eras within the same setting. And sometimes the characters are in multiple seasons at different ages. Uh, okay, I think that's all our questions in the chat, um, unless I missed anything. And we will um, let's start doing the Simpsons stuff. So, I um, think that we will just start with the easy part. What? Who are the main characters of the Simpsons? And feel free to just use the text or unmute and speak out loud. Homer, Marge, Bart, and Lisa. Thanks, Morgana. Okay, so Homer, Marge, Bart, Lisa, and I'm going to put Maggie. I'll put the pets in parentheses, including Maggie. <laughs> just kidding. She's not a pet. She's a baby. But um, we have Maggie. And we have, you know, the dog, uh, and the cat whose name is Snowball, I think. All right, that's our sort of main family. And as a reminder, our setting for this show is suburban American town called Springfield. It's deliberately ambiguous where in the U.S. this is, but it's sort of implied to be maybe Kentucky or something like that in the sort of like middle to south, perhaps. Um, it doesn't really matter is the point, and it's deliberately kind of uh, ambiguous on where it is. Here's a question in the chat. What is SLH? That's the dog's name. Is Santa's little helper. Um, okay, so our town... So normally our town should, or our setting for a show should be really as specific as you can. It's sort of part of the joke of The Simpsons that it's not that specific of a town or setting, but we can look at the, the sort of guiding design principles of Springfield as one of American satire. So we are designing... Or the town is entirely designed to highlight sort of humorous aspects of, of American culture and sort of blow them up way bigger. So some things are almost a little bit deliberately stereotypical in, in such a way as to create the feeling this could kind of be anywhere. But like, for instance, we have the, the, the fast food restaurant, but it's like the grossest, greasiest fast food restaurant you've ever seen in your life, right? So I'm just going to put that on the locations <laughs> really quick. Krusty Burger is one of our... Uh, locations of the show, but you can see how that is der derived from the f design philosophy of the of the sort of world, though, right? How it's taking some aspect of American culture and then just like uh, exaggerating it until it's at a ridiculous comic effect, which is something we do with both the characters and also the locations in our story, in our many stories, I should say. All right, so that's our main family, and obviously different characters uh, sort of take on the mantle of main protagonist in different episodes. Largely, I. Th I think a, lo a, a preponderance of episodes are going to have either Bart or Homer as the sort of central characters in them, but Lisa has a lot of episodes too. And Marge is the one that gets uh, that I, was my least favorite as a kid, but now that I'm an adult, I actually think is really funny. So I think, ha and and she's definitely gotten more episodes over the years, but is the least kind of uh, central in a lot of the schemes they do, or a lot of the like. She's so, she's a little bit more reactive and a less a little less active of a character, I guess I would say. All right, let's list out our supporting characters. There's a bunch to choose from. Let's hear them. Anyone care to either unmute or type in the chat? Let us know who are our favorite supporting characters. Or the mo Let's start with the most central ones and let's build out from there. Okay, we have Mr. Burns. co-workers i don't remember their names you mean homer's co-workers lenny and carl yeah lenny and carl yeah okay who else we got dan says flanders apu mo skinner yep so we have mo principal skinner Keep going. Let's get like five more on there, then we'll start to organize them. 
because there's a lot to choose from. We have Barney. I'll put him with Lenny and Carl. Millhouse. Patty and Selma. So, uh, yeah, let's go Millhouse. Patty and Selma, basically the same character, so we'll just put them together. <laughs> All right, let's get one more. Groundskeeper, Willie. Oh, Smithers. Thank you, Nacho. All right, so we have Willie and Smithers. Okay, so we've even we've barely scratched the surface. There's way more characters than this. We could get into your disco stew and your 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 what's his name, your bumblebee guy, and all these other kind of weird side characters at the same time. But I think we have assembled pretty much the the greatest hits here. Um, so let's start to group these characters and organize them a little bit in terms of their importance and their roles within these stories, right? So we're gonna want to put Smithers and Mr. Burns together, and we're going to want to keep Lenny, Carl, and Barney together, and I'm going to put Mo with them too because Mo is the bartender where they all hang out. We're going to have a poo principal Skinner, and I'm going to put Miss Krabappel on here, even though I believe she's written out of the show now because the voice actress died. Um, we have Millhouse, and we have I'm just going to put other kids um, because there's a bunch of other kids like we have your Nelson and your Martin and all these characters too. Um, we're going to put Willie with principal Skinner, and we have. Flanders and Patty and Selma. I'm going to put Flanders at the top, though. Why am I putting him at the top? Because he's the main character's neighbor, and we're starting small, and we're building out from there. Okay, so the ways that you might kind of organize these characters are by the different, either attaching them to different primary characters, in which case we could either say, um, in Homer stories, they are largely going to revolve around the areas that Homer spends the most of his time, which are going to be at work or relaxing, right? And so the sort of, we could organize them in terms of the Homer story characters are going to be Flanders, Mr. Burns, Smithers, Moe, Lenny, Carl, and Barney, right? And then, of course, the other main characters in his family, but we're just trying to think of the many, many sort of stories that are going to result from having how many? 500 plus episodes in the uh, series? Oh, we have somebody mentioned Grandpa Simpson as well. I'm going to put him on the list too. Um, so, yeah, Grandpa. I think his name is Abe. Um, okay, so. Um, we can group them by character. We can say, like, these are all going to be the sort of Homer characters. And then you would organize the other characters by their relation to those other people, too. So we might say, like, the kind of Bart characters, the ones that he's going to be most bouncing off of and are going to be most involved in his conflicts are going to be, you know, Milhouse, Nelson, Martin, Ralph, people like that. And then we have maybe your sort of um, your Marge characters, which would be, you know, Patty and Selma, the teachers at the school because, or, or the, you know, she's going to be, she's Bart's parent, so he's going to take, go in for parent-teacher conferences and stuff like that. Um, I'm not really sure if Marge has any super close friends in town, except for maybe Maud Flanders, but, um, so you can group them by character like this is the point, or we can, I think it might be useful also to group them under the locations that are going to be really relevant for those people sometimes too. So now that we have these sort of arrangements of characters, we can already start to see how the, um, different, uh, how we can create different storylines just from combining them in different ways, right? Because a lot of the time, your A story is going to be a main character from The Simpsons crew plus a supporting character and some conflict either featuring the both of them working together against that thing or the two of them going head to head on, on some kind of conflict, right? So if it's like Bart is getting bad grades, then our A story is going to involve Bart, a main character, and a supporting character, Principal Skinner or Miss Krabappel or someone like that. So you can see how we can, if you're just trying to write a show that has a lot of possibilities for subplots, B and C stories, and just like, a, it's a big arena for tons of things to happen in this world, then you're gonna want a diffuse spread of characters that feel like they relate to the different um, uh, members of your main cast, right? So you're gonna want to be able to think of, oh, okay, these are three to five stories I could do with just Marge and the people in her sort of circles. And then also be thinking, like, sometimes what would be an interesting curveball we could throw in, too? Because what would a Marge and a Groundskeeper Willie storyline look like together? I'm, I'm sure they've done that. They've done every... I'm, I'm sure they've done every permutation of combinations of characters at this point. Um, but uh, you can start to see that just the interesting conflicts that would result from a character being thrown together with someone who is not from their circles and is not from their world. And sometimes that will lead to just as fascinating and sometimes much fresher conflicts, too. So let's start to think of the locations. So what are some of the most important locations in Simpsons? The, somebody says the school. Yep, so Springfield, 
elementary. I don't know if we ever really see our high schools, do we? Uh, power plants and the house, yep. So we have the place of work, we have the place of home life, and we have the place of relaxation, which is often going to be, you know, at home, at work, or at play are sort of the kind of like three um, arenas that most characters can be defined by. So we have, yep, Simpsons House, which we're going to, remember, we're going to be subdividing these or adding multiple points of interest within them. So we have the elementary, we have the power plant, which is where Homer works. What are some other locations? Quickie Mart and Shelbyville, okay. Oops. And uh, Bart is the one who ends up, hangs out at Quickie Mart the most, I would say. Yep, we have Shelbyville, which is not in Springfield, but is a nearby town that they have a rivalry with. Dan says the church. Yep, that's where we'll find Reverend Lovejoy. Um, any other big locations here? We have, I put Krusty Burger. Is Krusty Land, is that an amusement park in Springfield? Or do they just, I think they drive to it actually. So I don't even know if that's nearby. Um, but uh, we could say the other characters' houses too. So the easy mode would be, you know, Ned Flanders' house. Okay, so this is, we can, I think we can uh, make do with these. Oh, Joe Tool says treehouse. That's true, I forgot they had a treehouse in their lawn. Let's put that as one of the points of interest under the uh, house subheader. So in each of these locations, well, first of all, we can see that just by picking a main character, then asking where do they spend their time at home, at work, or at play, that will give us sort of multiple locations that we can use to use your main cast to, you know, blossom from there. And to we can um, figure out what would be some logical locations for our story just based on who you have. So if you have a character that's a fisherman, then one of the interesting locations might be, you know, his boat, right? Um, so within home and within some locations, and sometimes if you have a show that is denser and smaller, like a, a show that's set all in a haunted house, like Haunting of Hill House or like um, Servant or something like that. Or Servant is not a haunted house, but it's like, you know, it's, it's all set in one location. Then your locations are going to be like the bedroom, the hallway, the living room. The t and, your, and your points of interest within that might be something like, you know, the TV, the painting on the wall, the piano, stuff like that, where it's it's like these are... We have a, if we have a smaller scope of a show, then your points of interest are going to be smaller things, right? So here we have some points of interest in each place that are going to act as um, story seeds. So we can have stories that are drawn from these different things here, or they could perhaps be like so story elements. For instance, if we have like a racetrack as one of your locations that one of your characters is always going to watch the races, maybe we could say in one episode, they're going to enter one of those races and that could be a whole plot line for your show. So your your series Bible would probably will probably touch on some of these main locations. You don't have to make like a super comprehensive list of them, but it's a good idea if just for your own documents and for your own you know in your own sketchbook for your show to be thinking what are some of these places that will really matter and what are just some interesting things that can happen there. So at home we have the treehouse. I think that we have just the characters' rooms. So let's just say like bedrooms, Lisa, Bart, and Marge plus Homer. And then do they have a basement? I think they do have a basement. Um, so we could add basement or we could add living room. They always like to watch TV together. Um, and then in each of these places, we can start to think of some other points of interest or areas that matter within them. I think within the power plant, we obviously have Homer's workstation. We have a break room and we have Mr. Burns' office. And those are going to be the biggest locations there. Like most larger locations, we'll have about, you know, three sub areas that matter there, especially. So in Springfield Elementary, we have like, you know, Bart's homeroom. I don't really know if Bart and Lisa are in the same classes or not. I think they're not. Um, and we have like the playground. We have Groundskeeper Billy Sheck, where he murders children in the <laughs> in the house, uh, Treehouse of Horror episode where he's kind of like Freddy Krueger. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, we have a comment in the chat. They don't have a, yeah, that's true. I, they may not have a basement. I think they have a garage. They, I know they do have a garage. I, I guess, I can't remember if they have a basement. Anyway, um, so we can start to see different ideas for stories based on these, right? Especially if we start to, I mean, just as an exercise, we could just copy and paste. We could just grab random characters off of this and put them under some of these locations and start to get ideas for stories, couldn't we? Like here, I just grab Mo and I put him under the church. Who's a main character? Who's who's a who's a uh, part of the main cast we should put with Mo in the church? Which of the main Simpsons family members? Uh, 
Or I could just pick one. Okay, I'll just pick one. You can interact. I mean, feel free to leave. Uh, this is an interactive class. Feel free to just leave comments in the chat. It's not a, not a, uh, no right, no right or wrong answers, I should say. Um, let's just pick Marge, um, because I'm just picking randomly. Okay, so we have Marge and Mo. We could put them in the church. And now I can start to already think, okay, wh how would we possibly get those two characters there together? Um, so, and we can also look at the dynamics between these characters as additional motivation for storylines, as those other little seeds of story that we can use throughout the entire run of a show like this to create unlimited narrative. So, what's the dynamic between Mo and Marge? Well, Mo has a weird, has, a, has like a thing for Marge. <laughs> Uh, which is kind of odd because Mo is sort of antisocial and doesn't seem to like very many people, but he he's always had like a weird kind of like um, infatuation with Marge. Um, I think that uh, she um, doesn't usually realize this or kind of ignores it. Um, what else do we know about them? So we could I think Mo doesn't usually go to the church, so this, that could in fact be a reason in and of itself why they're together in this episode. We could say this episode is going to be about Mo's crisis of faith. And it's Marge who's going to be the one that tries to get him back on the right track by bringing him into church. Or maybe he's going to try to scheme to get closer to Marge to try to steal her away from Homer by going to the same church as them. Maybe in a time where Marge is the only one really going routinely, he can use that to try to get closer to her. So I'm just, this is just like an example of how you would use these elements here and just stick them together to start coming up with interesting stories because it forces you to justify how those dissimilar or diffuse elements could possibly come together in a rational, coherent way. So I hope it makes sense why just writing out these, um, like a big list of your characters and locations can be really helpful for generating story concepts, which again, if you're writing a pilot that could have multiple entry points you might need to do before you really find what is the proper way to start this show. It might require you to come up with a couple sample different pilot episodes that would um, be potentially the entry point into this world and this web of relationships. Okay, um, so any questions on anything we've talked about so far? Or let me check to see if I've missed a name. I don't think so. Okay. Um, feel free to type in the text chat. Oh, Emily says she has to leave. Thanks for coming by. Feel free to check back later this month for more one-off events like this. Um, let's uh, maybe move into the next part of this, which is going to be... Well, I hope that this has at least been somewhat illustrative of how these shows are going to look on paper when we're just in the planning stages of them because obviously there's way more that you need to do to flesh out each of these characters, and we're only able to do so in quick bullet points because this is a 25-year-old show, and we know them. Like, just the pop culture of this is really widespread, and, and we don't need to define who Homer Simpson is for uh, our purposes here, do we? Um, obviously, when you're writing out your own show concepts and developing the premise in your sketchbook, you're going to want to go much deeper, at least a few paragraphs into each, or like at least one solid paragraph, I should say, at least into each of your major characters. Um, probably a couple paragraphs on the tone of the show and of the, the rules of the world or of the sci-fi or the fantasy elements, if there are any, things like this. And then when you start to go through the character breakdowns, mentioning these crossover points and these, like, points of conflict between them, like, you know, Mo has a thing for Marge. She doesn't realize it. Um, Homer hates Flanders from the bottom of his soul, but Flanders um, seems to only like Homer more the more that he hates him. Um, these things that are going to come up again and again throughout the show might be worth delineating in those character breakdowns in your actual um, your Bible type documents if you have anything like that um, so I think that the the next thing that we'll, we'll move into um, is well, first I'll check to see if I have any slides that I want to do before we go into this next exercise oh here I do have a slide about story engine let's talk just briefly about story engine just make sure that we all understand what this is so this is that central conflict or those elements of conflict in your show that will sustain many episodes of a theoretical series. So the story engine is not something that you need to write out in words. It's something that should be apparent and clear that it is there. Um, and in Simpsons, for instance, the, that primary story engine is just going to be the family, the main characters there. 
and just their connections to the people in town around them. We don't need to really question too deeply what the story engine of The Simpsons is because we have 30 years of the show. But when you're thinking of what is your own story engine, be thinking this should just be something that becomes clear through your series and pilot log lines. And it's a combination of your characters, story world, and the situations that will continually generate new and interesting conflict throughout the years of your run. And a strong story engine will suggest hundreds, potentially hundreds of hours of television. Obviously, a limited series will be more like 8 to 20 episodes of television, but depending on the scale of what you're presenting here. Um, we don't need to define spec, I don't think. Um, we don't need to go into getting staffed. Uh, oh, my headphone batteries are kind of low. I think it just told me I'll need to swap them out soon. Um, so this is what a logline looks like. We're not actually going to be doing logline stuff today um, because I wanted to take the focus off of premise a little bit and how to come up with a good premise and more on once you have a premise, how do you start to populate that world with interesting locations and story elements and characters. But you should at least look at what the logline of a show looks like because this might help you if you're newer at this and aren't aware of just this kind of ground level basic thing that is required to make a show, which is a sense of focus and small like a, a presentation of the idea in such a small in a small enough package that anyone can kind of understand it and get what the show is about which means that it's just one sentence whenever you can we have one sentence for that the series which sort of expresses the kinds of conflicts that are going to be coming up again and again in the entire series for a series logline that's going to look a bit like this um, we have both the status quo and premise based shows here at Ozark is a fast talking financial advisor drags his family from Chicago to the Missouri Ozarks where he must launder $500 million in five years to appease a drug boss. Um, so we get the idea of, okay, that's going to take a couple years to accomplish. That's like a larger goal that we're going to watch the first chapter of in the pilot, but that's going to take a long time to accomplish. That's why it's important to mention the time frame there in five years, right? So if you're doing a premise-based show, you should try to make it clear what the run and scope of this will actually be, if it, you know, with a limited run. We have a status quo show below at Blackish, which is a sitcom. A black family man struggles to gain a sense of cultural identity while raising his kids in a predominantly white, upper-middle-class neighborhood. So in this case here, notice how the specifics of that conflict are so much less concrete, right? Or just that the, the conflict is he struggles to gain a sense of cultural identity. That's not really a goalpost as much as it is a description of many different... It's like a description of a type of conflict, and that's the sort of situation that the show will revolve around. And sitcoms often are going to work best with this kind of describing the type of conflict, not like the specific goalpost, whereas premise shows usually need a more concrete goalpost where we're like, okay, $500 million in five years, and then the show is over. We've accomplished the sort of main crux of the action. And usually we can conceive of it like a movie in the sense that this is going to be the most important events of your main character's lives for the most part. There's exceptions to that, like, I don't know. Seinfeld or something like that, but oh, but that's not a premise show. I, I guess in, in for premise shows, it should usually feel like this is the most important events of your at least main character's life. Same with movies. Like with a movie, usually if it's not the most important events of your character's life thus far, then you've miscalibrated the stakes in the first place. Any questions on log lines and just these one sentence expressions of these ideas? Let me check the stream chat. Where did I, where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. Looks like nothing in the stream chat. All right. Kind of a quiet group today, but um, hopefully we'll get some uh, some we'll hear some voices that we haven't heard before as we move into our um, exercise here, which is going to be we're going to plan out a brand new TV show. And we're going to design the framework of both the status quo and a premise-based show. So um, I think that I'm going to just make executive decisions on the premise as uh, as they come up, just so we don't spend way too long trying to figure out what the show is about. But in terms of suggestions, what's an unusual, dangerous, or particularly fascinating job that you haven't seen a show center on before? This will probably be for a workplace comedy, but if we get inspired in some different direction then that's fine too. So what are some jobs that you've never seen a show about but that you think are interesting?
and it's okay if you know that there is a show out there about it but you just haven't seen it yourself um in theory but um what do you guys think feel free to chime in Nacho says translator. Okay. Keep going. Paleontologist. Paleontologist. Okay. Yoga instructor says Joshua. Thank you. Let's keep going. Let's list a couple more. Gambler says Morgana. That's not a job, but I'll, I'll list it anyway. <laughs> Why can I not write the word gambler? There we go. How about some more? Electrician. Okay, electrician. Postman. I like Postman. Uh, developer. Let's... I heard developer. Does that mean like software developer? Video game developer, software, yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. So, software developer. Let's do two more. Unemployed person is not a job. Boy, I wish it was. All right, we got a couple more on here. We have liaison officer. I'm not exactly sure what that even is. Skyscraper, window cleaner, and urologist. All right. Window cleaner. Liaison officer. Did I spell that wrong? Yes, I did. All right. So um, we have a lot of shows based on workplaces. Why do we think this is? Why is a workplace a really good place to center a show around? I think in an office setting, you can do a lot of interesting characters, like, and it's one place. I'm thinking of The Office, Larry Sanders Show, Parks and Recreation. So. And, and, by and office, people can relate you mean... to by office, you mean just any workplace, right? Because work, it doesn't have to be in an office itself. You, you would just mean yeah, it's a, a place of business. Place. Okay. So, yeah, it's one location. So, it keeps your. So, the effect of that is what? It keeps your cast centralized? Yeah. Okay. What else? There's daily challenges. Daily challenges. Great. Can you so explain? If it's a store. Yeah. If it's a store, for example, the different customers that come in and their demands. Yeah, because jobs just, just have di different problems that come up, but they are within the umbrella of the skill sets of the people there. So it's rarely is our problems going to be completely out of anyone's skill set there, though that can lead to interesting challenges too. But yeah, there's various daily challenges that come up at these workplaces. Um, somebody also mentioned it allows you to have a, a variety of characters. And to that I will just expand and say they're thrown together potentially from different backgrounds, right? Often people in the same jobs will have similar backgrounds, but that's not always the case. And when you find, you know, some shows like Abbott Elementary really do um, bring out very different dynamics just from the characters coming from different places. Any other reasons you guys can think of that workplaces oh, we make good shows? I think we have some comments in the chat. Smoke and Fury says it's familiar to most people. Yep, that's true. It's, um, at least if it's a job that we're familiar with, then it is relatable and we can understand the dynamics at play much easier. Um, and then Jotol says recurring expectations, character web, power dynamics, and social hierarchies. Social expectation and conflict with characters' actual nature. That's a good answer. So um, I think that we'll have to... let's look at each of these different aspects when we are coming up with um, both the characters and the details for this story world. One second. 
So, keeps cast centralized. Variety of characters thrown together from different backgrounds. Challenges, it's familiar. Recurring expectations and character web and all these things here. So, let's look at our list. And um, let's uh, pick a job to come up with a... Let's just for now, what's what's coming to me best is workplace comedy. So look, something, let's think something like The Office, right? Um, but uh, some some job that we have never actually seen centered on before, or maybe some twist on this that can make it feel a little bit different. Um, okay, so we have translator, paleontologist, yoga instructor, gambler, electrician, postman, software developer, urologist, window cleaner, liaisons officer. Okay, I'm going to bold a couple that are really jumping out to me. Postman workplace sitcom seems interesting. I don't think I've seen one of those. Um, yoga instructor, that would maybe be a show, but I'm... It's not really speaking to me as much. Paleontologist could be funny. And window cleaner, I wonder if there's enough there for a show. Liaison officer, I'm not sure what that is. Somebody will have to explain. Is he a uh, urologist? This is, uh, am I thinking of the right thing? This is somebody who, oops studies the urinary system of oh, the yeah exactly okay functions and disorders of the urinary system i'm not sure there's a show there that sounds more like a character in a medical show i'm not sure if you could do or you could just do an all urologist sitcom but maybe if you have some absolutely brilliant idea for that then that could work um software developer i think we have seen in things like mythic quest um electrician i'm not exactly sure maybe if we had some kind of like I bet somebody who was an electrician would have some ins have some insight into that world as and a as to the various interesting challenges and webs of characters that you might see there. I just don't quite know enough about it. I guess I would say. Um, let's pick the last one as I guess we'll go with yoga instructor. Okay, so here's three options. What do you guys like the most? Let's just feel free to just weigh in and let us know. Thinking of an office type show, what which of these three jobs do you think would support that the best and lead to? All these things that we were talking about, which were... Where did I put it? Centralized casts. Characters from different backgrounds. Facing interesting daily challenges. Which of these jobs do you think is going to best suit that? I think Postman, personally. Postman? Okay. Yeah. Why do you think? Uh, it reminds me, it, I can see, like, this is an older show, um, but it reminds me if you could do something like Taxi, which was from the late 70s, just like, they hang out, and, you know, also, like, Newman, like, the when you see, like, him at the post office in Seinfeld, I thought that was funny, where, like, um, it's a bureaucracy, a government bureaucracy, and, like, it, 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 You'd have to remember Seinfeld, like to the episode where Kramer wants to cancel his mail, and it's funny stuff. Okay, so potential to make fun of the kind of absurd, absurd bureaucracy of the government. Yeah. Um, I can. I imagine they probably come from pretty distinct backgrounds for the characters there. Oh, yeah, I think I like the Postman one as well, unless somebody has a really strong case for one of the other ones. Dan says paleontologist because you go all over on digs to every corner of the earth. That's true. I could maybe see a paleontologist one as well. Um, for the, for for my purposes, for paleontologist, I start thinking more sci-fi, horror, or fantasy kind of jobs just because it seems likely that those characters would stumble on, you know, your Stargate or your dinosaurs or things like that. But I'm sure you could also do a office-style sitcom about paleontologists. Um, here's somebody, okay, they've explained. Liaison officers just communicate between stakeholders, like olden day messengers, but generally for improved customer experience. Okay. Interesting. I would like to see that show from somebody who knows about that world. As someone who has no idea about that, I don't think I'd be able to do that, but could be, um, could be fascinating stuff. Morgana says Postman's also more working class. Yep, that's true. They have a working class element. I would think the only thing really working against this idea is that postmen don't usually do... Aren't they driving around by themselves, usually? Don't they work alone? If no one knows the de details of how postmen work, that's also okay. Just wondering if... Does anyone off the top of your head know? Do they 
drive around in the same car? I only ever see one of them at once. Yes. They do. My okay. sister has worked as a, as a mail carrier. Oh, really? Okay, great. And so they're alone in that car. Um, do they ever meet up with their... Do they, like, go back to the post office and hang out together? Any do they do show? what? Do Sorry? they, like, go back to the office and all hang out together? Or are they kind of, like, independent Yeah, and sometimes they... I mean, no, they're all employees. Yeah, I mean, I don't know of any contractors, but, yeah, it's, like, government employees. Okay, so they have relationships with each other, you think? Definitely, Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. I think my sister dated some coworker or something. Oh, another postman. Okay, great. <laughs> I guess you don't say postman. You said what? Ma- mail carrier. Um. Yeah. Yeah, and they have you know supervisors, and they have all this kind of the people who, you know, sort the mail and Ooh, all kinds okay. of drama. You know, there's a lot of people working in the in each post office, right? And you get different routes, like a different, you know. Like, there may be a few post offices in a certain area, and, like, everybody wants to work at, like, a certain one of them, you know? Like, mm-hmm. imagine, like, you have a franchise of whatever, subways. You know. A franchise of subways? Wait, in what... It, wait, they're delivering between different subways, or what do you mean exactly? No, I mean, like, a a company that has... Um, like lots of different branches and maybe mm-hmm. the employees like one branch is like you know a better place to work than the other branch oh 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 right? I see or, what you mean okay yeah so yeah. You're, you're saying the post offices are kind of like a franchise where there's mm-hmm. some desire some more and some less desirable yeah elements. and it's really hot man I mean they have no AC in those things and like in the summer she would like you know bring big things of you know, she would just freeze bottles of water, like have lots and lots of ice because they drink a lot of water, like, you know, during their route. Dang. I'm sure they it's do hot, in the summer. Man. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, she was in Arizona. So we're already starting to see some of the elements of a story engine here, I think. One of them being that the post office as a government sort of service is going to be notoriously underfunded, right? And so that's going to lead to all kinds of conflicts. So let's actually start assembling a, just like elements of a story engine. Underfunded uh, office leads to what kind of conflicts? Well, stuff breaks. Um, We are understaffed. Um, We uh, might need to bring in emergency, or like you have to, um, if you don't have enough staff they might have they might end up sort of hiring anybody right they'll take anyone who comes in different kinds of conflicts might result from that i could see lots of those we have some more desirable some less desirable routes so perhaps we could say competition between the different drivers for routes or other preferable elements of the job or maybe sometimes, do they get tipped? No, they don't get tipped, do they, mail carriers? Um, but you go to some houses, they might give you a cupcake or something, right? So you might have like, uh, or, you know, the, some of them might have a mean dog outside. So that's the, ho- the house that you definitely don't want to go to. So we can start to see stakes developing and certain conflicts starting to emerge organically from this, where maybe in our first episode, our main character hates that he has to walk past the mean dog house every single day. And now he's trying to trade his route to somebody who has a better route. But in order to get it, he's going to have to do something for them first, right? So I can already start to see the different stories here. I'd actually be surprised if nothing like this had ever been developed. Um, yeah. Some... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to... I don't know if this is relevant, but some some of the... My sister felt that, like, the boss steal packages. The boss would steal packages? Yeah. From the... From the yeah. uh, like out of from the, the mail, um, yeah. No, from, just like, mm-hmm. like she like, was like very, from the uh, like from the trucks during the route, or from the facility before they go out. Um, not quite sure exactly where or when or something, but there was you know, like she told me like, if you send it, make sure to get a you know, 
certification or something like it was that bad <laughs> so, okay so does, yeah yeah all right great so let's say crime <laughs> that would be fraud oh, i my guess would be that they would steal it and then report it would just be assumed to be lost in the shuffle of unlimited mail fraud that i'm sure happens all the time uh everywhere um, so yeah, let's throw that on the list of the ele story engine elements too. We have crime, fraud, stealing, package, what are they called? Porch pirates. Oh, we definitely have to do a porch pirate episode, don't we? Um, where somebody, like one of the main characters, they keep trying to order stuff to their own house and stuff keeps getting stolen. So they need to work together with a few of the other mail carriers. I was going to say mail officers, mail carriers in order to devise a way to trap the, or, you know, stop the thief. Of course, then they're going to find out it's one of their other co-workers, aren't they? Or they have, you know, that's going to be your Dwight of the of the office, for sure. Um, okay, so uh, we also we have working class. Okay, so we have bad bosses. What else is going to cause conflict in our world of post office deliverers? I have bad bosses slash um, workplace politics. What else? Competition with UPS and Amazon. Oh, yeah, so competition with private companies. Ooh, whoops, what happened here? I think my browser exploded. Oh, there it is. Uh, here we go. 